Wow, what a beautiful song. When God made you, he must have been thinking about me. Some people have a different confession. When God made you, I don't know if he was thinking about me. <laughs> yes, he was. And just as God brought Adam and Eve together, he designed that relationship for his particular purpose. We've been talking about marriage, and we've been on this one particular admonition in the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, in a list of several other things that this writer encourages and really prompts and charges those who would read this letter to remember to do. It's about 35 to 38 years after Jesus had been crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. And this particular generation of believers, most of them, as you can tell by the title of the book, were at least Jewish by physical descent. And some of them have been ostracized, of course, and some have been excommunicated. Some of the mounting pressure that had begun to develop, this is around the time, nearing the time that Tacitus would come in, medically be suffering as a result. And so it was a time of persecution in the midst of persecution and crisis. It's interesting what leaders tell us to do, how leaders tell us to think, have, and operate in is the ability to interpret reality. I believe one of the most important from scripture, one of the most important qualities that a leader must have and operate in is the ability to interpret reality accurately. It's one of the most important things that has to happen in every life of every leader. In fact, when you look in the scriptures, you'll see this, that when God brought his people to the forefront, that is the ones that were willing to walk with him, they always seemed to know what time it was and what the nation should be doing. And we certainly need that. This is not some luxury. It's a necessity. And then the list of things that's listed there in Hebrews chapter 13, this is one of them, one of them, one of several. There's, there are others, obviously. And so we want to continue focusing on this because this is a major part. This is also uh, an emphasis that obviously then transcends time. It doesn't really matter what's going on in your life or in my life. Uh, we do need to honor marriage. Married or not, we need to honor marriage because of what God intended marriage to be. This verse reads, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Our thought for today, our focus for today will be on that last phrase, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. We often have individuals who do our private judging and we look sometimes to the courts of our land to engage in judging. And there's a proper role uh, that all of us have in determining what has gone on and uh, distinguishing it, separating it out, and then also making some kind of decision regarding it, whether it's right or wrong and what really needs to happen as a result of either it being right or it being wrong. And so our theme for today, our thought for today is God and defilers of marriage. We won't get finished. I'll have to pick this up uh, later on next, this Wednesday and also next week, but we'll get going. Now, if we go back, that first line is very important, that marriage is honorable among all, or it is to be honored. This is an affirmation that, uh, this, is a, this is a statement rather, that God wants us to affirm, to say that not only we agree with, but we approve. When we affirm something, we agree with it and we approve it, right? We need to affirm the true worth or the true value that God has assigned to marriage. We've talked extensively about what that means, what that involves. It involves uh, taking a look at where marriage came from, who created it, that it wasn't the creation of just society, uh, God created marriage, and we've looked at the revelation of marriage, at least in part. The word re revelation means an unveiling of it, an exposure of it. This whole idea of revelation has been thrown around in religious and spiritual circles, and even political ones and philosophical ones, so we're not quite sure. But what the Bible means by it is 
to unveil it, to unveil something that has always or already been there for quite some time. It's not the creating of a new idea. That's not where a revelation is. A revelation means that there's a, there's a sculpture there, but it's been covered, or there's a painting that has been completed, and it's been covered. And now someone comes and lifts the veil or lifts the cover. So we see what's there. So we're not coming up with new ideas, new religions, new thoughts, none of that. The new thought community, which is growing in popularity here in America, it's always been for centuries. But it's, it's still not what God is about. Uh, before there was anything called time, as we know it as human beings, God is. And he, uh, he, determined, he determined so many other things prior to even man's uh, conception and birth. Uh, this, is, this is critical, especially now as we consider all the different ideas that have to be discussed. And so the revelation of marriage means that God already had in his mind what marriage is and why it exists, why it would exist, the reasons for it. I've given you eight different R's as we deal with marriage. We've not covered them. We've only covered two so far. But the revelation of marriage means that you and I can define what marriage is, what it really is. Not just what we do in marriage, what we're supposed to do in marriage, not even only why it exists, but what it is. It is a God-given, God-created relationship covenant relationship involving t two different genders a heterosexual male and a heterosexual female that he joins morally spiritually emotionally even intellectually to be what he calls a husband and a wife to get the word husband from the word husbandry one who tills the ground and cultivates it and produces, right? Helps to, in the production process. And there are many other things. Husband can also be a shepherd. But we also see that the wife has the role of being joined to this man. She was carefully made, fashioned, is the Hebrew term, uh, the definition of the Hebrew term for built. She was fashioned to be in covenant joined relationship with this man for the reasons that was in God's mind. But before we got to that, we talked specifically about the fact that God brought them together to be a, a, uh, a mystery and an openly revealed secret of the kind of relationship that God wants to have with all of humankind. Whenever you think about that then, because it was created by God, that makes it very valuable. We have to make the distinction between it being created by God or created by religion or created by sociologists or psychologists or anthropologists or anything of that nature. It was created by God. It was created by God. God, having made humankind in two genders, brings together the very first human relationship, which is not a brother and a sister, not a brother and a brother, not a sister and a sister, not a mom and a dad or not a mom and a child, and a dad and a child. The first human relationship God created is marriage. This is why it's so important to honor it. Number one, God created it. Number two, marriage impacts all of us. Married or not, it impacts all of us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Everything we are about is inseparably connected to our understanding of marriage and to the value we place on it. Okay, I want to say more, but we'll go on. And then we talked about the reasons for marriage. We gave one reason. One reason is uh, really seven reasons. One that we really focus on is that marriage was created to be a declaration and a demonstration of three things. The, the mystery of God in terms of his relationship with humankind and in relationship amongst himself. And then secondly, it is to be <clears throat> a prophetic, a prophetic doxology, a prophetic praise. That's what marriage is. 
Marriage is to be a prophetic praise unto God. And thirdly, another reason for marriage is that marriage exists and was created in order to be a rich or wealthy theology, to provide a wealthy, solid understanding of who God is, how God operates. And we focus on two, two important attributes of God. There are seven, several that we could have focused on, but focus primarily uh, on, in light of the context from Genesis chapter 2 on the love of God and the oneness of God. That marriage was created to be built upon and operate in the love of God, not the love of the world, not the love just of being human, the love of God. There is the love of God and there is the love of the world. There is the love of God and there is the love of the world. I'll say it again. There is the love of God. There's an understanding about love that only comes from God. And then there's an understanding about love that doesn't come from God. It does not. It's from the world. Influenced by Satan and demonic powers. The love of the world is primarily about affection. The love of God is primarily about covenant devotion. It's totally different. You give your life not just for yourself that's the love of the world what's in it for me that's number one in the love of the world in the love of god in the love of god it's different for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life he did it for us yet there were certain things that would come back to him but he did it for us with the purest of motives. No trump card, nothing that God's going to get out of it that's just only going to benefit him and not benefit us. That's the love of the world. The love of the world will kill everybody, write a note and kill yourself. So there is the love of God and then there's the love of the world. Two different wisdoms. The love of God... I, God operates in his love out of his wisdom. The love of the world operates out of the wisdom of the ages. Code phrase for demons, Satan, and human beings. It's deadly. It never produces, it never produces what it promises. The only thing it produces is a good feeling. It never produces anything that lasts. There are many Christians wondering why they're so sad and depressed. They think it's because people don't love them. But it's because you have never really learned what it means to operate in the love of God. Catch this. Even when God is hurt, even when God is grieved, even when God is anger, he is never vindictive. He never hates in return. He never reviles in return. He never gets you back in return. The love of God is different from the love of the world. A lot of our songs and all this kind of stuff fill with the wisdom that comes from the world about love. Even in church. We think we're not loved or that we're not being properly loved because we don't understand the love of God. When we find that somebody's missing it with us in the body of Christ, the question isn't just making sure they get straight and we get them straight so they can treat us right. The question is, to what degree am I willing to walk in what Jesus said? Love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully mistreat you. Not just asking God to bless them, but converse with God about them. That's what prayer is. Prayer is not just saying, bless them God, bless them God, because I can't stand them. Please bless them. <laughs> bless those who curse you, but pray. Dialogue with God about people who despise. Despitefully mistreat you. 
you may find out that the reason why they're despitefully mistreating you is because they really are hurting or they're really jacked up or they're really demonized or they really got some other stuff going on. They need to be healed. They need to be delivered. And if we're caught up in our feelings, we are not entering into no kind of dialogue that's going to lead to any level of spiritual warfare for somebody that we know jacked us, played us, misused us, despitefully mistreated us. Say it again. We don't really understand the love of God. It has to be revealed to us. One of the most beautiful pictures of it, as gruesome as it is, is the cross. It's not sitting down at the local Hilton with folks dropping grapes in your mouth, running around at your beck and command for any and every little thing you want done. That doesn't mean people love you. It means they learn how to appease you, especially if you've got enough money to keep them on the payroll. True love, true love from God seeks to love people in light of or show affection and commitment to them for what is best for them according to God's standard. Now ask yourself this question. Let's be honest. Do you love like that? Do I love like that? No. All these years of walking with Jesus, he still got to work on me with this. Right? And, and it's, it's, it's necessary. So we affirm the true worth of, or the value that God has assigned to it and the reasons for being married. Okay? The second admonition is to keep the marriage bed pure, to keep it undefiled. Uh, and I, I'm convinced that... Uh, an undefiled bed is rare, even for married folk. Titus 1 verse 15 says, to the pure, all things are pure. That means there's no admixture. There's nothing in it polluting it. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, that means untrustworthy, unfaithful, it also carries the idea of not being persuaded. An unbelieving person is not persuaded. An unbelieving person is not persuaded. They mouth the words, I believe, but they're not persuaded. That's why they're so shaky. It's impossible to really walk with God in belief and not be confident and persuaded. Paul said, I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which God have committed unto him against that day. Paul taught Timothy, do the things that you are sure of. You follow me and my doctrine, my purpose and all this other stuff. You do the stuff you are sure of. Sometimes unbelief is, is uh, unpersuadedness is, is a choice. The spirit of God can really be, as they used, the old saints used to say, all over you. And you just push it away. Push it away. Uh, can't go down that rabbit trail, but this is important. That we're not pushing away. The day you hear his voice, don't harden. This, there's this deception that if I harden, it's for my protection. And that may be true when you're dealing with a crook or somebody who's ignorant or somebody who is, who is immature, who really isn't thinking through what they're telling you or requesting of you. That is never the safe way to go when you're dealing with God, to harden. What do you mean by harden your heart? Refuse, reject. Don't really focus. Shun what God is really seeking to do. So to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, we'll take a look at what the word defiled means again here in a moment. And unbelieving, nothing is pure. You, you there yet? Ain't nothing pure. Ain't nobody true. Everybody lying. Once a cheater, always a cheater. Once a crook, always a crook. Once a liar, always a liar. Ain't nobody true but you. 
and you're not even true. It's hard to trust somebody else if you don't even trust yourself. And if you don't trust God, if you always second guess yourself, always second guessing God, you're going to second guess me. You, you don't have a choice. You may be nice to me and think I'm a nice person. But nobody's pure. Nothing is pure. Marriage isn't pure. Family isn't pure. Job ain't pure. The boss ain't pure. Nobody. Nothing. We just all survive. What a hellish life. God ain't pure. No, no, because if God was pure, he wouldn't have let what happened to you happen. He wouldn't have let you get raped. He wouldn't let you get molested. He wouldn't let your daddy leave, your mama leave. You lose your house, you burn, your house got burned down. He wouldn't let nobody get divorced. He would let nothing happen that hurts anybody if he is pure. No, 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 I don't mean it like that, Pastor. I don't mean it like that. I'm just, I'm just saying I'm still trying to figure it out. No, that's what you mean. What you mean is he, you're not persuaded that he's pure. It's not purely motivated by anything he's allowed or what he's doing. Wow, is it that tough? Mm hmm. And the enemy thrives on us vacillating back and forth over what's pure and what's not. The wisdom of the Lord is first, wisdom from above is first pure. There's nothing unclean in it. The motives of the Lord are pure. The, the fear of the Lord is clean. See, this is everyday living. The relationship that God wants to have with humankind is the kind of relationship where we're confident that God, we're persuaded that God is pure. That he means mean no ill as difficult as life is. God is pure. His light, in him there is no darkness. So to be pure, notice this, nothing is pure, but both their mind, their understanding, their reasoning, and their conscience, that's the part of your my thinking and our reasoning that basically judges and cast a judgment on whether or not something is right or wrong. Paul said it like this in Romans 2, that the conscience accuses when something is wrong, or it excuses when something is right. Every one of us has a conscience, a capacity within our whole, all of our thinking, that judges. I don't want nobody to judge me. I don't want nobody to judge me. We do it all the time. Everybody does it. You can't help it. You're created and made in the likeness and image of God. God evaluates stuff. You can't help it. It's a part of who you are to judge stuff. Well, wait a minute. The, the Bible says judge not. That you be not judged. That's because you don't understand what the scripture means. It says that, but that's not what it means. Why would God create you with the capacity to make judgments and then tell you not to judge? You can't help it. Where did he buy that jacket? Where did he get those clothes? How much did that ring cost? How much did that table cost? I don't think they should have paid that much for it. You just made a judgment. <laughs> Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Why'd she wear that? Who's she trying to get? Get your own husband. I got mine. Judgment. Why you say that? Why you use that tone of voice? Why you talk to me like that? Why you looking at me like that? I know why you did it. I'm ready for you. <laughs> Judgment. <laughs> you made a decision. You evaluated the situation. You made a decision. One story told about a guy who was <laughs> trying to sell some product. I can't remember what it was. He got turned down the first nine doors. When he got to the 10th door, he said, I don't care if you buy my product anyway. <laughs> Man just came to the door to open the door to see who was there. He was so mad, all so, so, so tired of being turned. I don't even care if you buy my product. <laughs> Judgment. Never even gave a guy a shot. Been turned down nine times. It's going to happen again. 
Man dogged you in the past. All men are dogs. Woman played you. All women. None of them are to be trusted. That's why I had a nephew tell me, I don't trust no women. Hmm? Why? Judgment. Okay, so what are you, what are you using to determine what the judgment ought to be? See, your conscience, my conscience, you're my conscience. Paul said it like this, my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. His point was the word of God and the witness of the Holy Spirit helped him to determine whether or not his conscience had registered in on something being right or wrong. In God's eyes, the defilement of the conscience is a critical thing. Because we're conceived in sin and made in iniquity, we come here with a defiled conscience. We come here with a conscience that's already been jacked up in terms of its reasoning ability for determining whether or not something is right or wrong. So what we're left to is what we like and what we don't like and what we always kind of grew up with and what the culture says is right or wrong. And we accept that either because somebody beat us into it or somebody uh, did something else to force us to at least live with it, even if we disagree with it. So we've got a lot of unhappy people in the world, a lot of unsure people. The word defile means to stain or tent or spoil or contaminate. It can mean also to poison or to soil or to debase or deform or impair something. A defiled marriage bed then is a place and a space internally. Okay. We know that the, that the word marriage bed really has to do coite, New Testament coitus. It is the sexual bed, but it's also the place or the space of covenant. The only people that are supposed to be in the marriage bed are in covenant, not just with each other, but with God. We got a lot of covenants going on. We got my things. You understand? We understand. We're keeping it real. 100 is 100. Uh, yeah, we understand each other. Whose covenant is that? Yours or is it God's? I'm with you. You know, I'm with you. I'm down with this. I'm down. She knows she can count on me. He know he can count on me. Whatever. We ride or die. Based on whose terms, for whose purposes, because that's what covenants are. Did those terms and purposes come from God or did they come from you or from the culture or from him or from her? The person, you know, you live in your truth. Then you walk in your covenant and you're responsible to keep the covenant you created because God ain't responsible to keep that. You made that. You made that. He's not responsible. How come the Lord won't help us? He won't help me because you, you, you forcing your covenant understanding on the God. Oh, no, we don't. Marriage is just a piece of paper. No, it's not. You know that. You want to catch rats, dogs. If you want to drive a car, somebody has the document that you understand what you're doing and you're committed to walking according to certain stipulations and obligations, purposes and rules. You want to go out here and shoot quail or shoot rabbits or carry a gun. It's documented somewhere. When come to marriage, I don't need that. Why not? God wrote stuff down. Wrote the Ten Commandments down. I mean, God, God writes stuff. Keep the book of the covenant, put it up there near the ark. Why? If he, if he, all you got to do is just commit it to memory. Just live in the spirit of it. No, he wrote it down. And then we trip it when God, when it's time for a marriage, like I, it's a defilement, but it's, it's because of a defilement, a poisoning of the mind and the conscience. So the marriage bed then is the place and the space. There's a certain space that I am not supposed to go to, not just sexually, but even emotionally, intellectually with another woman. Jesus said, if you go there, you've committed adultery, Ray. You don't have to touch her. So there's a certain space inside of me, so to speak, a certain dimension. Not allowed. 
don't even want to go there by the grace of God. See, so this is this is important. The marriage bed. How you defile it then? A defiled marriage bed is the place or the space of covenant, of communion, of cohabitation, of clinging, of copulation, of conception, of celebration, communication. You go through the whole list that becomes stained and tinted and debased and deformed and impaired by sexual immorality and other sins. It's the understanding of the inner judge, that's the conscience, okay, of right and wrong with the commitment level to marriage that are contaminated, that's damaged, that's poisoned, that's impaired by various sinful beliefs, sinful values and behavior that violate God, violate God's word and your spouse. And we could carry on with the list, your children and everybody else. And, and you know we can we can try to smother all of this over and veneer it with all gifts and toys and trips and great sex and getting high all you want to, but it's poisoned. There is no trust there because there's a rejection of God's truth. Trust is severely wounded. And we all know the dangers of trying to live in a severely wounded, with severely wounded trust. I'm not saying it can't be healed, but it's going to take time and work for that to be healed. It won't just happen because you love me. It's like someone walking up to you that you really trust, taking a butcher's knife, jabbing it into your gut and ripping it up your chest. And then coming back. After you survive it three days later, you're laying up in intensive care in the hospital saying, would you forgive me? Because I know you love me. And what we got, it, and nobody can come between it. You might forgive him, but you're going to have a, it's going to take a while to trust that dude, to trust that woman. The word trust in the Bible means that you hide in this place. You, you confide there. It's a place of refuge. You expect to be protected there. You're not crawling back up in there with somebody you know is schizo. In their love. So who and what defiles the marriage bed? As we looked at it this past Wednesday night, and get a, if you didn't get a chance to, to be there Wednesday night, it, it should be online for us. Uh, we covered these three things. We won't be able to go back through extensively, but I'll just remind you. The scripture says sexually immoral and adulterous. Now, if you think of this only on a, on a natural, physical level, you go, that, that's it? Yeah, that's it, because of what this represents. What sexual immorality and adultery really represent are covenant breakers. They're idolaters. They're idol worshipers. The sexually immoral, yeah, almost all sexual uh, practices, immoral practice was a part of various religious worship expressions at the time this was written and even prior to that and even to this day. The worship of literally the sex organs of a male or the sex organs of a woman was a part. And then uh, sexual orgies. And the prostitutes of, of those days, many of them were not as some of us think of them, though they were like that. But there were those who served in temples, males, male cult prostitutes. And folks would come and have sex with these males as a part of their worship. So with God, if you were married and you were doing this, you were an adulterer. If you were not married and you were doing this, male on male, male with female, male with three or four males, male with three or four women, whatever way it, the configuration went in the worship, you're an idolater. Why? This is the kind of wisdom and direction that only comes from Satan and demons. This is not for the purpose that this religion says it's for. The real power and mindset behind commanding this, requiring this, or okaying this is satanic and demonic. If you're engaging in it, you may not even be aware that that's really what it was about. 
That's why we study the scriptures and we don't just read them. That's why we study it. We put it back in its context, take a look at what was going on at the time to understand what was meant. And that's part of what was going on and it's still going on. Where you got porn in your pocket or access to it. I was coming along, you had to go in little back rooms and all that kind of stuff. Now it's in your pocket. The access. As we enter into that, if you enter into that, you're actually entering, Paul said it, under this inspiration of the Spirit. You, you join yourself spiritually with a certain mindset and with a certain demonic power. You're not just kicking it with somebody you love. When you violate God's truth and violate God's word in this way, this is, this is tough. I know this sounds harsh. And if it wasn't because of the satanic and demonic uh, influence behind this, we could be lighter with it. I'm telling you, Satan is determined to destroy creation, the human being's mind, the human being's conscience, the human being's body. That's what he gets his kicks off of doing because he knows how much it grieves God. You're a pawn. Someone has used this example for several different groups, two opposing groups. You know, Democrats, Republicans, rich, poor, whatever the case might be. The filthy rich with the less rich. When two pit bulls fight, the grass in the middle and under their feet take the severe beating. It's not just about the pit bulls that are fighting. It's about the poor that are being trounced while y'all trying to make up decisions. Please understand this spiritually. There's no way that Satan is equal to God. But in his battle and warfare against God, he hates you. He hates God. And the best way to hurt God is to destroy you. To keep you floundering around and kicking it in ways you, don't, you weren't designed to kick it. To keep you from really admitting that the real reason why you're trying to kick it like this is because you're hurting. You haven't really discovered who you are yet. You don't buy what those preachers in that Bible says about your identity and your purpose and your destiny. The church is outdated. The church is old fashioned. The church is just in it, the money game like me. They're using God to make the money. That's, that's the line that he continues to give us. Or to get us to keep just pushing it off to the side, never really facing it, never really dealing with it. So the sexually immoral and adulterers are in fact idol worshippers and are engaging in idolatry. They're worshipping the God of sex. Not just sex, the God. Inspiring, instigating, pulling for, demanding worship. Anything you worship, essentially you are bowing down, laying prostrate before it and say, I am your servant. I live my life to please you. I, I totally surrender. This is part of the reason why it's so difficult when we come together sometimes as a local church because worship gets confined to a building or a place or a certain expressions of worship like singing and uh, dancing, music aspects of it. The music is really um, a way to help us to continue engaging with God in the same way we were doing before we even got here. Worship is yielding to the point of losing, not consciousness, but losing myself in the presence and the purpose and the power of God where I live my life not to please myself but to him who died and rose again for me furthermore I live my life understanding that God changes what really pleases me you can actually grow to the point in your life where you really recognize that what you thought pleased you really doesn't and you quit trying to go back to get pleased there Years ago, back in the day when Pastor Ron Tucker was 
was a lead pastor at the church that the Lord blessed and the found. He taught one Sunday on a different subject, but he talked about as, as research uh, dealing with the issue of sex, how uh, a test was conducted with a rat. You all heard that story? They, they applied certain uh, nodules to the uh, electrodes to the, the rat's brain. And every time he got stimulated sexually, well, he would, he would go and touch this device. And every time he touched it, it would translate, it would translate into um, orgasmic, sexual orgasmic responses. The rat kept going back until it fried its brain. It just kept going back. It was never enough. Because you were not designed just to be, to live your life from orgasm to orgasm to orgasm to orgasm to orgasm to orgasm. Whether the orgasm is sexual or physical or intellectual or even quote spiritual or emotional. You are not designed to live your life orgasm to orgasm or four, one orgasm after the next. And that's what in many ways human beings have become. We're just... I want my mind blown. I want my emotions blown. I want my spirit blown. I just go from one church to the next, one conference to the next, so I, they can just blow my mind. Just blow me. Just one orgasm after the next. Orgasm is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a powerful thing. Okay, physically, emotionally, all the rest. But that's not how you were designed to make it through the bland times, the mundane stuff. When it really ain't that exciting. And it's 20 below zero outside. And you can't have no orgasm because you got to go to work. <laughs> That's what you were designed for. You were designed to live your life to the praise of God's glory. Good times, bad. In between times. Fun times. Sad times. Grieving times. Hard times. Kicking it on the beach times. Every bit of it to the glory of God. But if all we're trying to do is... What other reason do we have to live? Why? I understand a person who doesn't know Jesus who had never really given his life to Christ. I get that. I really do. I understand that. I'm not here to castigate anybody or even us as Christians for that. But we need to understand what's really going on. We keep going back to the same thing, knowing that it's only going to produce a temporary relief and eventually we get fried and then we're wondering why we're fried. We've never accepted or approved of the real reason why God created us and put us here. We keep coming up with these other reasons for being here. My happiness, my pleasure, my stuff, my money, my vision, my dream. My ministry, my business, my wife, my kids, my family. What I've always wanted to do is. And now what I always wanted to do and who I always wanted to be is in competition. With what was in the heart of the father before you were ever even a gleam in your daddy's eye when he looked at your mama. I know this, this sounds like dream killing preaching. It isn't. It's trying to get us not to settle for a substandard dream that will never, ever really fulfill you. Never. It cannot because it came from you. We're reaching and clawing and trying to be significant and prove our significance and our worth and our value. We want the whole world to stop and take a few seconds to honor who we really are and what we're really about as we live our truth. And the truth of the matter is, ain't enough time for that. Ain't enough counselors, not enough stages. Ain't enough time on TV, internet, digital space or nothing. And even if we all got our moment, who's watching it? Because you're waiting on somebody to watch you. Is that why we're here? 
to have our orgasmic moment when the whole world sings the songs I write. For real? That's the reason why God created us? So that someday everybody can come and say, what a grand, awesome church you are. For real? Boy, Raphael, you've got a great, awesome ministry. For real? No, we've been called to live our lives to the praise of his glorious grace. And along the way, a few people may say some things like that. And we thank them. It encourages us. It affirms us. God uses it to build us and to strengthen us. But that's not the reason. Lest we make other dreams our gods and become idolaters. So that we are intimate. We're intimate in the deepest way. Sexual immorality. We're intimate. See, sex is a way of describing physical intimacy at a level that is reserved for people who are in covenant with God and with each other according to the marriage vows that God has told them to take. And so the sexually immoral are living out not just a body-to-body -body joining that's illegal. They're living out a, a mindset. They're living according to a reason that came from hell that glorifies Satan. I know that this, this pastor ain't nowhere in the world all of that's in there. Mm -hmm. That's what it's really about. That's really what it's about. And so we end up being flesh ruled in our living. Sexual immorality dishonors and rejects God's meaning and God's value of sexual gender. It dishonors and rejects God's meaning and value of sexual identity. It dishonors and rejects God's meaning and value of covenant marriage. It prevents holy and intimate communion with God and each other. Idolatry blasphemously dishonors God. It says there's another God, and you're not God at all. Idolatry openly defies his word. It says, no, I ain't doing that. And it rebelliously des desecrates his meaning and his value and his purposes for marriage. Carnal views, flesh rule views and values prevent genuine participation in the love of God and the oneness of God that's essential for the fulfillment of God's purposes for marriage. The result is strange children. Nehemiah found that when some of the folks that he was sent to help there in Jerusalem, priests included, as they mixed and mingled and met and married folks that were not only not Jewish, but that were not God-fearers and were not really in covenant with God, they said they produced children who did not know the language of Judah. That wasn't, they, they, they couldn't speak Hebrew. That, that may have been true too, but they didn't know Judah's praise. They didn't know the, lang the language of praising Yah. They didn't know the language of what it means to live in covenant relationship with the one who created their nation and gave them purpose. They knew the language of the culture, of the people, of their mamas who did not come from that place. Strange children come out of sexual immorality because there's sexual, there's in sexual in sexual activity. There's eventually, if not immediately, there's there's conception. Put this on a put this on a figurative spiritual plane. Strange babies come out of fooling around in sexual immorality. Strange things come out of consciences that have that have been defiled. Strange stuff comes out of understanding that's been defiled. It has God's name on it. It has Christian terminology and biblical terminology on it. But it's not of God. It's not. It looks like it is. And the world tells us it is. Because religion is religion is religion is religion is religion. Faith is faith is faith is faith. It doesn't make any difference if you're Islamic, if you're Jewish, if you're Christian, if you're Baha'i. It doesn't make any difference if you're Buddhist. It make any difference. All of y'all say the same thing. All of y'all are after the same thing. That's, that's the interpretation of somebody who's ignorant. 
who has a defiled mind and a defiled, a poisoned conscience. They don't realize that that's what it is. It sounds like I'm being bigoted by saying it. But they're the ones who have a, have a, have a jacked up understanding about all this. Doesn't even make logical sense. Think about it. Doesn't even make logical sense to make that statement. Unless your reasoning is off and your understanding is off. Here's the reality. The results of strange children and ungodly fruit, which we often refer to as, you know, I just did my best and God understands my heart and, you know, we're going to make it work. I didn't do it right, but we're going to make it work. And so the tragedy is, in many cases, much of what God is really still desiring to do in and through his people, it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because, not because there are folks who don't want it to happen. It doesn't happen because in many ways we don't understand the power of carnality. The power of carnality is that, uh, carnality means that I am living my life unaided by the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. That's what that means. I'm living my life under the rulership of how my body feels and what the mindset or the thinking is without God's input. And on the surface, there, there's a whole lot of stuff that is legitimately cool to do with God. What God really has a problem with is why we're doing it. See? Let me give you an example of that. I, I, uh, I've been checked by the Lord about this many times, that the reason why I do something is just as important as what I do. Right? And, and often there, there are reasons for doing things that don't quite make the grade with God. I give you something because you gave me something. I call you because you called me. Right? I check on you because you checked on me when I was going through. So we already know the people that despitefully mistreated us, they ain't getting no call and they ain't getting no visit. I don't care what God says. They're not getting a call and they ain't getting no prayer. Other than save them, move them, or kill them. Because I don't want nothing to do with them. You see what I'm saying? And so often God holds up on certain things because that's ungodly fruit. It's still tainted. It's still poisoned. It's still not the reason for doing what we do. People, ha people who have are engaged in covenant damaging, covenant breaking. Here's what the point of this, what it means to have a defiled bed then is. This place of intimacy has been defiled, has been poisoned, has been damaged because of covenant damaging or covenant breaking beliefs, and covenant breaking b behavior. They're deal breakers. And God says that if your spouse sleeps with somebody else or has sex with somebody else, guess this, that's a deal breaker. You understand that God understands psychologically and emotionally what's happening to you when that deal gets broken like that. But that's not the main reason why, why, why he says it's a deal breaker. He says it's a deal breaker because you are now acting in a way spiritually that indicates that you either don't get what covenant really is or you don't care. You're defying what I told you is necessary for marriage. Not just what the society says or what the preacher says or the Sunday school teacher or your friends or what your gut check tells you. You're defying what I said it's for. And you're continuing it. And you're coming up with all these strange children, all this ungodly fruit. Stupid stuff like God understands and God knows my heart. Okay? You know what a stupor is? When a person's in a stupor, it means even though they hear you, they, they can't, not won't, can't work their way through to a place of understanding. Ignorant means I'm just unaware, but when I'm educated about it, it changes. When I'm in a spiritual stupor, I'm in a place that requires divine deliverance. God has to break the power of the stupor, not just on my mind, but on my emotions, even my conscience, to, 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 to set me free to see. I still have a decision to make after I've been set free to see it and understand it and get it. But often... 
We don't get that far. One of my struggles with accepting the call to ministry in this particular capacity is what I was experiencing before I accepted it. And that is people don't like to be told what to do. They don't like to have stuff explained. They don't, generally speaking, unless it's usually really close to them. And even then, they listen to it guarded. And I learned that as a child and as a teenager, as a Christian. Most people don't, they don't, they want to think of whatever they want to do on their own, come to their own conclusion, okay? For some people, they're concerned if you're close to them that you accept it and that you approve it. For others, they don't give a rip whether or not you accept it, whether or not you approve it. So being a pastor, I would be in a role where I would be expected to teach the word of God. And though there are some individuals who really want to learn the word of God, there are many, many people that are guarded. And they really aren't interested in being, quote, told and taught. Because after all, pastor, you ain't perfect. You don't know everything. True. Main reason why I didn't want to do it. So for the most part, this is an exercise in futility to me. Until God gets involved and show, shows all of us that that's just part of it. And it, and, it, and it forces us in a way to a place where we learn to really trust God to speak and to communicate and convince. And also to see the ways that you and I and our own personalities and temperaments and styles need to change. But be, just because it's true, the way that I'm delivering it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best way to do it. Does that, does that make sense to anybody? Okay, Maybe even today while I'm teaching now. Everybody has a certain emotional capacity, mental capacity and health that's there. And God, God is conscious. He knows our frame. He knows we're dust. He knows us, top to bottom, inside and out. He knows what we're really like under pressure, what we're really like when everything is cool. He knows what we're like after we've been abused. He knows all of that. And he knows already that for, for most of us, the reason why we're so guarded is because we've been hurt. Or the one that one reason that none of us likes to admit because of the pride. We're just we're just prideful. We don't want to be told nothing. We want to learn on our own and then go do what we think is the right thing to do. Now, I don't need nobody talking to me no hour and a half about nothing. I can learn. Well, you think I'm a dummy or something? That's a few. Yeah. So it's it's a real it's a real struggle, see? But there's some deal breakers. There's some deal breakers. According to the word of God. Not according to the word of Ray, according to the word of God. There's some deal breakers. Between me and Bridget, there's some deal breakers. Uh, you, I, I, know, I know you're going to live right because if you don't live right, Pastor Brenda going to do blah, blah. You know, that, that may be true. But the real deep reason, I know for some people it's a fantasy, it's a myth, but it ain't no myth to me. I will stand before God. Oh, yes, sir. And before I go to stand before God while I'm here in the planet, the Lord has been known to, shall we say, kick behind. Right. So this this is this is not this is not just because I fear what my wife may say or do or not do. That's not sufficient motivation for a whole lot of brothers. OK, don't even look in that direction. All right. What is it? The love of Christ constrains me. Yeah, that's real talk for me. And I'm not trying to set myself above nobody or nothing, but that's real talk for me. Yeah, yeah. There, there are lots of times when I could come, you know, out the loo where I grew up. I know most of y'all ain't never seen that, okay? But I can come from another place. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't, no, okay. You can come from another place that's not of God. And what it produces is strange children, ungodly fruit. You walk away looking strong. You walk away looking like you got control of the situation. But all you got is a bunch of strange babies. An ungodly fruit. 
I remember as the Lord began to drive that point home inside of me, how I had to finally admit that the pride in me didn't want to have to deal with it like that. Just get forgiveness after you say what you're going to say and do what you're going to do. But it's the strange children part. See, it's when these are now 30 and they're wondering what they should do under that kind of pressure. There's got to be a picture in their mind that Papa responded in a way that I thought was stupid, weak, dumb, like a chump, like a punk at the time. But they connected to this book and they connected to the God of this book. That's what we're talking Otherwise, we're going to have strange kids. Okay? My Lord. Who or what defiles a marriage bed? Ungodly contrary vision. Ungodly contrary mission. Ungodly contrary priorities. Ungodly and contrary expected outcomes. Why are we here? What's the priority? Pastor, are you serious? <laughs> I've had to, as serious as a heart attack. Both of whom came on unexpectedly. You wake up one day and you discover that the way you've been eating and the way you've been sleeping and the way you've been living and the way you've been working as good as my intentions were, still led to almost killing you. But for the grace of God and the prayers of the saints of God. Come on, saints. There, there. It. Okay, Lord. Uh, there, are, there, there are many times in our lives and we will be challenged on the real reason why we do what we do and, and we need to go back to vision mission priorities expected outcomes and if any of these are not uh, as a result of the breath of God and of the word of the word of God you're gonna have train you're gonna have, you're gonna have some deal breaking mentalities and deal breaking attitudes and deal breaking stuff that's going on all right let me let me close the third admonition, God will judge the defilers of the marriage bed. As we look at this, what we learn from the scriptures then is that when God judges defilers uh, and defilement of marriage, I mean of the marriage bed, he's also dealing with defilement of marriage. The reason why a person is willing to defile the marriage bed it's because they already have a defiled understanding and conscience about marriage. Something's not right. Again, this, this, this is tough to a degree to, to, to speak and to say because all of us have been here and, and God has to, to correct us. Now, what does it mean when the scripture says that God judges something? Does it mean that he's just sitting up, snub nose, mad, got a big two by four, just waiting on you to go off so he can whack you? <laughs> I've seen some parents like that. <laughs> it's almost like they're itching. Come on, come on, just take two more steps. And I'm going to kill you. I'm gonna kill. Woo! And they get a rush when they get a chance. Hey, you pop! Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I feel like now I feel like the father, the mother I'm supposed to be. Some people have that idea of God that he's just he's just just itching and just hoping so bad we mess up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you to I'm gonna give you to 2025, and as soon as we get to 2025, I'm killing you. You'd be amazed how many people think of God. That's all he's waiting on. He's waiting on a chance to crack you. Waiting on a chance to break your back. Waiting on a chance to let you know I'm God. I'm the law. And I'm going to do what I say. 
most of our minds go into to just unable to comprehend mode to hear God weeps or God sings or God is grieved. Because we, in our minds, we don't even think like that. God is mad. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. He's just waiting. And I know you're going to do it because you're human and you're sin. You're full of sin. So I'm waiting on you. I just can't wait till I can hit you. I just, I want to hit you so bad. I want to hit you so bad. Where you get that mentality? Unfortunately, some of you seen it in your own parents. And unfortunately, some of you saw the exact opposite, but it's in you. You just, you just can't wait. You just, you can't wait. Something so empowering about being able to slap a kid, isn't it? It just feels so good just, just to slap them, to knock them into eternity. Because you're going to learn to fear God and fear me. Isn't that amazing? That's why we have this, the, the behavioral science community trying to get folk out of some of our homes. Because you got a problem. You got a problem. There's something going on inside of you, and you need to deal with your anger, you need to deal with your rage. You need to deal with it, sir. You need to deal with it, ma'am. You need to deal with it. Yeah, you're right that they're wrong. You're right that they're wrong. How many times did God do that to you? Let's just leave out the other people. How many times did God really just come at you and just lay you out over the stuff your kids don't even know you did? Okay, come on, can we be real or are we going to play? How many times did God plead with you, work with you, send you people to help, send you people to try to help you change your mind? You know, all them times that you should have been dead, sleeping in your grave, but the Lord Almighty forgave you. Gave you, not just one more chance. Come on, let's, you got to count better than that. Come on, you got to count better than that. He didn't just give you one more chance. Come on. You, you think it's because you were so good and you cried so hard when you walked with God and you fell again and you cried again and you fell again and you cried some more. You felt, you, that was the reason? Because you cried? You think God didn't know that you was going to fall again after you did all that? <laughs> no, no, he knew you was going to fall. He knew you didn't mean it. He knew you thought you meant it. He knew you didn't mean that. We're talking omniscient God here. He knew you were conned by your own con. And he still loved you. Still love to somebody ought to bless him. Yes, sir. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Come on. So why are we like this with other people? Why aren't we like he is toward us? Because we don't understand what it means to be judged. We really don't. All I'm going to say is I'm going to have peace in my house. If I kill everybody in the process, <laughs> I'm happy. <happy's> <laughs> sure. I'm working twelve twelve hours a day. Come on, ain't no way in the world you're gonna sit up in my house acting like this. And that's true, and that's right. But there's a right way. There's a there's a, there's a wrong way. Wait, right, that's for family. We'll come to family in a little while. All right. Oh, say, the, the word judge means, is crino. It means properly, catch this, to separate or distinguish. It means uh, to come to a choice or make a decision, right? By making a judgment or judgment call, we would say. Either positive, that is, a verdict is in favor of the person or the situation, or it's negative, which rejects or condemns. Jay Thayer, who was a very popular, well-known uh, a grammarian for New Testament Greek uh, comments that the proper meaning of crino is to pick out or choose by separating. So in the process of separation, you're picking out and identifying things for what they are. Plato used the term to talk about distinguishing things. Typically it refers to making, uh, to making a determination of right or wrong, innocence of guilt, especially on an official or legal standard. 
Now for us, the legal standard or the official standard is the word of God and God himself. I always try to keep those two together because when we separate the two, we give the impression that God is one thing and his word is something else. His word and his and, and himself, and they, they're, they're one. This comment is made by another scholar. We only judge accurately by intelligent comparison and contrast. Stay with me on this. We're almost done. We only judge accurately by intelligent comparison and contrast based on God's, God's word. In other words, compare means you're looking for what's, what's similar or what's like. Contrast, we're looking for differences. Now, if you go into judgment only looking for what's different, and all you harp on is what's different, the contrast, you're not making fair judgments. Your child says something right. Maybe didn't say it right in the right way. That's the contrast. But if your child told you that you are insensitive or that your child told you that you act like you don't care, you need to stop. Don't just wipe it off. They tell you you're not listening. Then, then, then quit acting like your child just all of a sudden committed blasphemy. They may not have said it the right way. That's the contrast. But compare it. Compare it to what? The word of God. Is this true? Is, is what she say? Is what he's saying true? Because I, I have to deal. I can't whitewash. I can't just overlook that. No, you just do it. I say, no, no. You're damaging conscience and understanding with that impurity and that poison. Stop. Pull back. It hurt your feelings. It was done disrespectfully. Listen. Check in. How many people told you that you don't listen? Your mama told you, your daddy told you, your 3,000 boyfriends told you. Your co-workers told you that. The person that you really loved and it didn't work out with, he told you. Now all of a sudden, you're going to hit this child for all them 9,000 people. Yeah! Because the child can't fight you back. The question is, did they tell you the truth? You can work on their style, their method, and correcting them later. The thing you have to stop and ask is, and I have to stop and ask is, did it tell me the truth? Probably couldn't look close to home. We were upstairs in the ministry lounge, get ready. Uh, I think it was before or after service, give me what it was. There was a lot of crowd of people in there, and we were talking and talking and talking. And my daughter, Ariel, she must have been maybe, you know, eight or nine years old. I can't remember what age she was at the time. She, and uh, maybe a little older, 10 or 12. And, and she said, Daddy, and, and in my mind, I thought, I hear her, but as soon as I get through with this, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get to her. And she said it again, two or three more times. Daddy? Daddy? My, my, we, daddy? And then I, I looked and went. And so I went back to what I was doing. She said, Pastor Ray? I turned. <laughs> and my heart sunk. I heard her when she said, Pastor Ray. But I ignored her when she said, Daddy. Which is more important to a child? Are you, you're just trying to embarrass me. You just, no. The truth is. See? What's the truth? You want, you want to make this work for real? Don't go home and write no, no letters and, and all this other kind of stuff. Just you know, look, when soon as you, if you understood, you know how much I did for you? How much I did for you? You know how much I did? Yeah, you did. You did all that for him. You did it. And part of it you were supposed to do. Okay, I can't go there either. <laughs> you know how many folk, how many folk are mad because you did what you're supposed to do? And now you're not getting the level of appreciation that you know you deserve because of what you did? Nailed to the cross for you and me. 
And he's still getting the finger from some of us. Turn around, give somebody a high five. Say, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. I'm going to get this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting this. We got, we got to make certain distinctions. When God judges, he makes contrasts. He makes comparisons based upon his own perfect word and will and nature. Let's say you go out here and you, you rape somebody and you kill her. Talking to a brother. And you ask God to forgive you. Right? What's supposed to happen to you? See, because the, the, the judge, he's got to make some decisions. Here's a daughter that's dead. Because you couldn't keep your pants zipped. And I'm sorry is supposed to mean what? You get to walk free? While this mama, this daddy, and if she has children, almost crawl up in the grave with her? This, when God judges defilers, that's what he's got to take into consideration. Do you understand what you've really done? Do, do, do you get this? And do you understand that you violated my, my, my loving, righteous, faithful, trustworthy, true, just, holy nature? That this is not how life is supposed to work. And, and, and something got to be done about this. this this can't just be oh I'm sorry Lord you, you know how it is God you, you know me you, you know how I am Lord you, you know you, you, well, you know how I am and the Lord says yes I know how you are so come on let's, let's get this together but in the meantime I'm going to let you sit in jail for about five years so we can get some stuff together because what you did what you did, though you don't understand it, I'm going to give you some time where you can come to the place where you understand that you are operating according to a satanic and a demonic understanding about life. And you are dangerous in the earth right now. You're going to hurt a lot of people. Now, I could let you die. Is this too harsh? No, no, because this is, we only judge accurately by intelligent. And I, I wish he had used the word this writer uh, by godly intelligent comparisons. And contrast based on God's word to approve what is correct and reject what is inferior. You see what's going on here is God separates and makes distinctions and evaluations and decrees according to his word and his wisdom his character his love he also lovingly and wisely implements the decrees he deems best and appropriate I came prepared to read but we're out of time for doing this but read read Leviticus 18 through 20 you know and Romans chapter 1 we're gonna to come to that maybe some of that on Wednesday and uh, if you, if you don't know that God loves and God is wise in what he said is going to happen or should happen, because it didn't always happen, the civil leaders didn't always carry it out. Which continues to damage understanding and continues to damage consciences. And for, for, for what seems to be an uh, understandable reason that they don't carry it out, because they really can't discern. See, when you reject God or you come up with your own definition of God, you don't believe in the Bible, then, then, or you come up with your own beliefs about the Bible, that men wrote the Bible and the interpretations are always so different and all that kind of stuff, and you can't discern when the Spirit of God is for an interpretation that you have, or you don't think it's necessary to believe in even trying to operate like that, then, then you go with what you already know. Pedophiles walk the street, and folk that smell weed end up in jail. Uh -huh. God works alone and 
Here's the part that gets scary. With appointed, approved leadership, not just in the church, but even in the civil and in education and all these other places, and others, people as well, saved and unsaved, in this judicial, restorative, and redemptive process. Because you can rest assured that as far as God is concerned, idolatry and carnal rule living destroys. It destroys. And that most of the insecurity and the pain that most people are living in has to do with defiled understanding and defiled consciences. So God is targeting that. Not you, not me. He's targeting that. That has to be cleaned up. When God judges the fathers of the marriage bed, then love and truth and power and covenant and justice and grace and mercy and integrity and trustworthiness and soundness of mind in and from God are necessary. When you and I get involved with God and judging the fathers, an accurate and rich understanding of the word of God is not an option. It's a necessity. What happened in Genesis 6? exceedingly exceedingly sinful pedophilia bestiality all of it kicking whatever I'm big enough and bad enough to do and God who created the universe just will sit here and let it go contrary to what he wants no we'll look at these other passages see in scripture another scholar Nakedness has been linked with sexuality, privacy, and vulnerability. In Luke 18, Luke, I'm sorry, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, you find this phrase, uncovered my nakedness. It doesn't just mean disrobing. Sometimes it does mean that in Scripture. But in these, many of these passages, it, it has, it's linked with sexuality and privacy and vulnerability. When the Bible speaks of uncovering nakedness, it's usually referring to some type of sexual sin or perversion or dishonor. The phrase uncovered nakedness almost always refers to sexual sin. In most newer versions of the Bible, the phrase uncovered naked, uncover your nakedness is usually re reworded as have sexual relations with your mama, your daughter's daughter, your brother's wife, your dog, your goat, another man if you are a man, another woman if you're a woman. You're uncovering this intimate place that was reserved covenantally with God. You're uncovering it inappropriately. You're exposing these individuals, not only physically, but also even spiritually and emotionally and psychologically to influences and to actions that are poisoning, that are damaging, that are debasing, that are impairing them. The orgasm was great, but they're damaged. Not only does a rapist need to find this out, but people that are consensual need to understand this. Something's going on in your understanding that isn't healthy. It's damaging you. You were not designed for orgasm to orgasm living. Your body was made for the Lord. And it's weird, and sometimes church, you know, I was growing up in church, don't do it, don't do it. And, and they didn't know how to say it. Or some of them really didn't know how to say it. I finally went on and accepted it. There ain't but one way to say this. Don't do this! Stop it! Stop! And you go to shut-ins. Come out of that corner, can't hide. Come out of that corner, can't hide. Come out of that corner, can't hide. God told me to tell you, you can't hide. Amen. Yeah, and he walked through. And I don't see Sister Jerry here this morning. Her mama used to come to lay hands on all of us. And was eight, nine, ten years old. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Yeah. The Lord, come out in the name of Jesus. I'm like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Yeah. My, my grandmother used to pray like that Lord don't let them grow up like weeds she lay her hands on it don't let them grow up like weeds like, we want the real fruit we want the real fruit don't let them grow up like weeds I started dating around and going out with folk and she, she put me aside she cute baby she cute but uh, don't lose your anointing over 
You should buy me a Samson. Over. Man, I'll probably know the story of Samson before I know a whole lot of other stories in the Bible. Yeah. She's cute. She's cute. Yeah, she's sweet. She's nice. But no, no. Ain't worth your anointing. It's not worth your anointing, son. It's not worth your anointing. What does he mean? What does he mean about it? You're anointing. You're anointing. See? Priests and prophets were anointed by God with oil and set apart for the purpose of God. And when Samson kept fooling around with all them women, he woke up one day and couldn't fight no battle. Mm -hmm. He ended up dying blind. Y'all, some of y'all want to die blind? Was it that good? You willing to die blind? You'd be fine as a day as long, baby, but you ain't worth dying blind over. And even worse, no anointing. Can't move in the spirit of God and the power of God. I don't care nothing about being the largest church in America or the largest church in St. Louis. But I do care about the anointing being present and manifested. Yes, sir. And learning how to flow in the power and the anointing of the spirit. Of, yeah, we care all about that. B-A-M-A, Ph.D., Dr. D. Down, they, 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 no, no, no. We need a movement in the anointing of God. The anointing crushes the yoke, breaks it. Oh, yeah, yes. Hallelujah. All right, God. I tell you, it wasn't just a fear. I said, God, please, I don't ever, 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 ever want to wake up and discover. I may not be at quote seemingly as anointed as I am some other days, but I tell you, I don't ever want to get accustomed to living my life without flowing in the anointing of God. There, there, there is nothing else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I tell somebody, I know what he's talking about. I know, I know how I feel. I know how I feel about that. Yes. God damn it. Got to have it. Got to have it. Not as a commodity, not as something to use, but because it's a necessity. It's more necessary than water. It's more necessary than air. Got to have him. Got to have him. And I'm not talking about a style of ministry either. God uses different people in all kinds of ways under the anointing. But we know the difference. We know the difference between intelligence and the divine power of God. Come on. We know the difference between movers and shakers and the natural and when the Holy Ghost really breaks the yoke. We know the difference between somebody helping you to reason through and discover why you do what you do and God setting you free. Yeah, he, he, he didn't call you here just so you can just rehearse and rehearse and rehearse where you came from and what somebody else did that was wrong. That's important that you're able to identify that but more important is that you get free. That you get healed. Yeah. That's why we're going through all this. Believe me, the devil knows why we're going through it because he don't want you to hear it, but the devil is a lie. While I was studying some of this, I said, don't forget now, they put the preacher in prison over there in Ukraine who preached on this. And they're putting folk in jail here and they're doing all this. You might have to, we're going to teach this. We're going to preach this. Yes, sir. Because something's going wrong with our minds and with our conscience in America. They're poison. I know everybody don't see that. I know everybody don't agree with that. But it's the book. It's the truth. The phrase uncovered nakedness almost always means refers to sexual sin. In most newer versions of the Bible, we just mentioned that. Hallelujah. Let me close this out. When God, ju when God judges, see, catch this and I'm going to go. Oh, I, I went, to, went to preaching, y'all, and I went too far down. I got too happy. Thank you, Jesus. God intended the uncovering of nakedness to be done only with his prescribed boundaries of marriage. Christians can honor our bodies by refusing to cover our own nakedness in the way we dress, talk. I'm not, and look, I'm not talking about style right now. I'm talking about the reason why we wear what we wear. Yeah. All right? Okay, and it's going to sound like I'm, I'll just leave it in the man's world right now. Because I'm skinny and I ain't got all the muscles. I'm not coming against the boy that got the muscles. But I'm telling you, you're not here to show off and pose. All right? Okay. We, we, need, we, need to, we need to cover certain areas because we're not here to see your crouch. We're not. We're really not. You, you, okay, this is supposed to be for a men's meeting. Your package is cool. All right? But, but that's not what this is for. This is about worship. 
Glory to God. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so, so I want to go to the next men's meeting. Thank you, Jesus. Christians can honor our bodies by refusing to, to, to uncover our own nakedness in the way we dress, talk, and behave. Nakedness is no longer innocent as it was in the Garden of Eden. I taught my girls that. And you, you, you may, you're thinking one way, but I'm, I'm, your daddy is a male. I'm going to tell you how unsaved males think when they see you. I don't care what you're thinking. Well, why do I got to live like that? Because this is reality, baby. It's reality. It's reality. It's, it's, it's just reality. If you walk into a room and you see a bunch of serpents, if you put your foot down, then you scream because one of them bit you. Okay. Now you're blaming everybody because you got bit. No, okay, they, maybe they shouldn't have a room full of Roman snakes. You can sue them for that. Fine, for having a room full of Roman snakes. But you putting your foot in there? You walking around in there? That's you. It said, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. I, I taught my girls this. Yes, I did. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, it's on them. Yeah, you're right. It is on them, but it's also on you. You don't go around flopping around, showing everything, and expecting to attract. You get what you advertise for. You advertise for folk that's just willing to live in trash. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get trash. And then you want them to change and just man up and be, be kind. And just, they, they're not. I'm, uh, stories told about a turtle and a, and a snake, right? They're trying to get across this, this lake. And uh, the turtle could swim, but the snake couldn't. And so the snake came to the turtle and said, look, let me ride on your back and I, I can get over to the other side with you. And the turtle looked at me and said, you're crazy. You're a snake. I ain't no fool. <laughs> and so the snake finally charmed him and, com and got the snake, got the turtle to, to agree. He got on the, he got on top of the, the turtle, got all the way across. And then the snake crawled off the turtle and turned around and stung him. And then the turtle said, why you do that? I'm a snake. <laughs> it's in my nature. <laughs> Till you get saved, certain things are just the way they is. Nakedness is no longer as innocent as it was in the Garden of Eden, and wise people do not uncover it in dishonoring ways. We'll pick this back up Wednesday night. Thank you, Jesus. He's finally quitting. Let's go. We're going to talk about how to apply the word, how God applies his word when, we, when he judges, okay? It's in love, it's in truth, it's in faithfulness, it's in mercy, it's in just. Just don't forget it though, but he applies his word. He applies his word. Father, we thank you again for the word of the living God, for the opportunity that you've given us to explore and walk through this teaching in this season in a time when you are emphasizing that we honor marriage. I pray that you would help us to see the value that we really hold in our hearts for it. We pray also, Lord, that you would help us to live according to the value that you've assigned to it. We pray especially for those who have been wounded in good marriages. Some have been devastated in, in bad ones. We pray for ex-spouses and those who are trying to rebuild their lives in the aftermath of all of this confusion. We pray, Lord, that you would grant your wisdom, that your truth and your wisdom and your love and your faithfulness would become more and more evident. We're conscious right now, Lord, that there are so many of us 
in this room right now who, whose hearts have been bludgeoned by some of the very things that you led me to speak on today. But we ask you by faith for the miracle of God. We trust you now for the grace to forgive and also the grace to work through the soreness, the pain, the recuperation, the recovery period. We desperately need you, Lord. Father, you, we trust you like we don't trust anybody else. And so we, we pray that you'd help us to discern clearer than we have in the past. Help us to discern where there is defilement and impairment and debasing and poisoning and soiling the breach of trust and the impact that it's really having on us. Help us to see when we really are stuck on just simply finding the stuff that's like what we've already done and failing to look at the things that are really in contrast to who you really are. We ask you, Father, to help us to, to clearly see your heart and how to respond in these places. Once again, we stand with you against the condemnation move that Satan and his cohorts are so accustomed to making during a, a season of teaching like this. We receive your conviction because we know you love us. I don't know how to say this any other way, but I just sense very strongly that there are a number of, of, of us in this room today, maybe even still watching, that, that is really really struggling with what has happened, not only in the, in the distant past, but even in the recent past in this area. And the Spirit of God wants you to know that he loves you. And as the worship team was leading us earlier, he loves me. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. And the pain and the consternation and the back and forth that you've been experiencing, God wants to bring that to a halt. In every way, Lord, that this teaching may have stirred up more distrust in families or in, in marriage relationships, we trust you now for the word of wisdom that is needed specifically in every couple where that's the case. I pray that there will not be a retreating to this, to this incarceration. There would not be a retreat to this, to this mind-numbing, walking on eggshell life. We pray in the name of Jesus for the wholeness of our God, the shalom of God to be manifested as, as there is forgiveness and where there is a, a true turning to you. Finally, today, Lord, we, we pray also for those who, who knowingly or most who unknowingly really do have a beef with you because you allowed some very painful things to happen in our lives personally. I pray for those who've been living under post-traumatic stress. I pray for those, Lord God, who's whose hearts have been roaming the hallways of life, looking for the place of rest. We ask in the name of Jesus that you remind them that you're pure, that the burning and the movement 
and the disruption is because of your purity and you're burning out the impurities you're not drowning us in it you're not incarcerating us in it you're burning out the impurities let that be so in the name of Jesus would you pray after me quickly please said Lord God I heard you today through your word and through these exhortations that you gave my pastor I ask you in the name of Jesus to help me not to lose focus I confess with my mouth what you've convinced me of in my heart you are Lord you are pure there's nothing rotten in you there's nothing dark in you you love me and I'm learning to trust you more I take all of these places these secrets that no one else knows about but you and me and I reaffirm my faith you love me God and I submit to you God come on just lift your hands in God's presence he's here he's here he's here God does not call you to live under condemnation he's not calling us to live there he's calling us to live in his peace but there is no peace where there is no repentance there's no peace where there is no righteousness there's no peace where there is no faith it's possible it's impossible receive the faith to repent thank you Jesus Lord I turn to you I turn to you it's not this person what they did said and, and did wrong only I can't change them I can't change I can't even change myself I need you to change me but I come to you to change me change me Lord thank you Jesus if you've never given your heart to Christ please just continue to pray on your own if you've never given your heart to Christ and you're here or you're still watching I relate to the struggle that, that many of you are having you're not quite sure what's right or wrong what's left or right what's up or down here's how you know the difference when God is involved he gives you an unmistakable unshakable yet a resistible peace if you resist the peace of God you'll stay in that place of confusion but if you welcome the peace of the Lord that what you've heard is true that Christ Jesus really is the answer that's when your day and your life will change for the better and it will become what God really intends for it to be. And though that may sound selfish on my part, on God's part, it really isn't. What it simply means is God created you. He knows you best. He loves you. And he wants for you more than you could ever want for yourself. If you were a part of the message earlier, you heard about the rat that kept going back. Pressing the little lever till he fried his brain, trying to get pleasure. Maybe you've already gotten to that point where you're fried from everything you've tried to do. To be at rest, to be at peace. Let go of this belief that God is just waiting to whack you. He's just waiting to kill you. That he really gets his kicks off of making sure that he puts his foot on you. No, here's what he said. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. If you want that life, around here we call it the highest and the best quality of life. If you want that life, the highest and the best possible for any human being to have, believe the gospel. Believe the good news about what Jesus has done to rescue you from the sinful condition of your heart in your actions God really did love the world he gave his only begotten son that if you and I would believe in him we would not perish but have everlasting life the next verse is important too and then I'm done 
God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That the world through him might be saved, might be rescued. If you want that and you're in this room or you're online today, would you just open your heart's door and invite Jesus to come live in you? The way I encourage people to do that, you can do it just simply in, in your heart and faith. But the way I encourage you to do it is through prayer. Through prayer. Turn. That's what the word repent means. Turn. Change your mind and turn. You don't just go any direction. You go the direction God tells you to go. Where is that? To Jesus. Receive Jesus. If you want to do that, let me lead you in prayer and doing it. Say it with me. Lord God, I've heard your word. I believe it. You love me. You sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to deal with my sin problem. I believe he did it for me. He was buried in the ground and you raised his dead body from the dead as proof that he accomplished what he said that he did. And so I receive him in my heart. I take him into my life. I surrender to you right now. No more my way, your way, Lord. Whatever that costs, I say yes. Amen? Amen. Let us know you did that. You can go online and let us know. And if you're here today, before you leave, out there at the table, you can leave your name or you can come forward. A few of us will be hanging around. We'll give you two or three different ways that you can do it. But let somebody know because the moment that you let someone know, you move into another level of maturity in your walk with God. God bless you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're continuing to do. We pray that your heart will be made known in our lives, that we walk in the freedom and the peace that only you can give us. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you and the Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and the Lord be gracious unto you. Receive it. May the Lord give you his peace. Live in the peace of God this week and share the love and the wisdom and the power that you've received in Christ. God bless. Looking forward to being with us on Resurrection Celebration. We're going to try to be upstairs at that time. So call your friends. We're going to celebrate the victory. God bless. Every time.